Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our service today. Thank you for joining us. And this is a remote service Sunday, if you're watching this video today, and because of the snowstorm. But thank you for joining us online. And we are going to now have some time of worship, music, and so let's join together as we worship our Lord together this morning. Condemnation grip 
Well, good morning again, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Now, on this weekend in our church family life is the weekend that we do our annual business meeting, and the senior pastor typically on this weekend will give a uh, yearly challenge or vision for the church family. So I'd like to do that today and as part of the sermon. And uh, so we are going to continue in our current sermon series entitled Faithful Living in Difficult Days from Second Timothy. And this is actually part two of the sermon from two weeks ago, if you remember. And let's just do a quick review. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verses 1 and 2, let me just read these verses for us. There are actually two 
commands, two imperatives that Paul gave to Timothy and I give to you today through the Holy Spirit. Paul says, you then, my son, be strong, be strengthened in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Verse two, and the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses in trust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Now there's two commands. The first command is in verse one. Be strengthened, be invigorated by the empowering grace that is found in Jesus Christ. It is from Jesus through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gives us this strength, this power to do ministry, to share Jesus with other people. And then verse two, the second command, and, and in trust, pass on the good news of Jesus to other people who will then pass on this good news to other people, and it is like a relay race, and this has been going on for 2,000 years to this very moment. And so how will this strengthen us as we share this good news with others as they pass it on? When we, when we are trained, when we go and train and develop other people, God matures us, he matures you, he matures me, and makes us stronger in our own faith. As we go and we share the gospel message with other people, this gospel message, really, it comes alive in us that it's like, wow, what Jesus has done by dying on the cross, being raised from the dead, oh, that's like life-changing as we share that with other people. When we teach about Jesus to other people, when we again actually say the words and we read the words from the scriptures of what Jesus did and what he is doing today and what he will do in the future, that brings amazing excitement to us. It strengthens us. It reinvigorates our spiritual life. Now, two weeks ago, I also shared with you that you need to see yourself as a spiritual trainer. You need to see yourself as a spiritual trainer. And this is what Paul is describing to Timothy of being a spiritual trainer. You need to commit yourself not to just being a disciple, a student of Jesus, but also to being a disciple maker, a student maker, or a spiritual trainer, or a spiritual coach, or a spiritual teacher, if you would like. But here's the definition in the final part of the review of a spiritual trainer. A spiritual trainer is one who invests in training others about Jesus and what he has done, what he is doing, and what he will do in the future. Now let's come back to our text and let's look at some new information in this challenge and vision for this coming year. Verse three, join with me in suffering. Join with me in suffering. And then Paul gives four metaphors. He describes what being a spiritual trainer or a spiritual teacher is going to look like. But first he says, join with me in suffering. This assignment as a spiritual trainer is not going to be easy. Paul says this to Timothy, and I say this to each of you today. Being a spiritual trainer is challenging. It can be difficult. There can be obstacles, as we've been seeing through this entire sermon series. And so the first metaphor that Paul gives us in verse 3, he says, be like a good soldier. Be a good soldier. He says, be a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled 
in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Now, we know that about an army soldier, that an army soldier, a military person, will have a single focus. And that is what Paul says to Timothy and what I say to you today. As a spiritual trainer, you need to have that single focus in a way that will be pleasing to your commanding officer. Now, the last few weeks, I have been reading an e-book that is about a war hero or a soldier from my hometown of Rockland. And this soldier was in the Civil War, the American Civil War. And his name was General Hiram Barry. Uh, he was in his late 30s when the American Civil War began. Uh, he was a, a local banker. He owned quite a few businesses. But he felt so intrigued to join the... Um, Northern Army, uh, the Federal Army, he went to Governor Washburn in Augusta and pleaded with him that he could be one of the commanders. And so Governor Washburn said, okay, you're going to be uh, a colonel in uh, a regiment. Go and find some soldiers. And so he went back to Rockland and, and the 4th Maine Regiment was formed. And soon they went uh, off to the Washington Washington, D.C. area to Virginia, and uh, they were involved. Their first battle was the Battle of Bull's Run in Virginia, and Hiram Berry was uh, well-disciplined, and, and his men were well-disciplined, and they uh, went into battle for the very first time and basically were defeated. Because it was not because of the commanding officer, it was not because of the soldiers, it was because they were using very, very old, old guns. Guns that were maybe way back to the time of George Washington, uh, 70 or 80 year old um, guns. And so they did much better as they, they had uh, newer um, arms. But as time went on, as the superior officer for Hiram Berry read the accounts and the reports of his steadfastness and his single focus of taking his troops, his soldiers into battle, he was recommended for a promotion to President Lincoln. And so ultimately, Hiram Berry becomes a major general. And Hiram wrote back to his wife here in Maine and said, this promotion is not a political uh, promotion, as was typically the case in the Civil War. He says, I was not promoted because of politics, because I'm a Democrat. And Governor Washburn was a Republican, and President Lincoln was a Republican, and he says, this is only a promotion because I'm a good soldier. And indeed, he was. And so the benefit of being a good soldier, even as challenging as it may be, is that you will hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Now let's move on to verse 5. In verse 5, it says, similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. So the second metaphor is be an obedient athlete. Be an obedient athlete. Run the race according to God's rules, no matter what people may say. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago, that there will be a lot of temptation to change the message that we pass on to other people, that we, temptation to change the gospel message, to change the message about Jesus, to change the message about what we discover in the Word of God, in the Bible. And Paul is saying to Timothy, no, you need to be that obedient athlete. You are not running the race to please people or to gain fame but to please the Lord Jesus Christ. And you can't change the gospel. 
You can't change about Jesus. And the benefit, he says here in verse 5, you will be the winner who will receive the victor's crown if you are the obedient athlete. Now let's go on to the third metaphor that is found in verse 6. In verse 6, it says this, the hardworking farmer, the hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Reflect on what I am saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all of this. Be a patient, hard-working farmer. A spiritual trainer will be like that hard-working, patient farmer. Farming, as you know, is not glamorous. Farming is slow and long and hard and difficult work. But Paul says to Timothy here, this promise, if you will be patient, if you will do the hard work, you will be the first to observe the spiritual progress in the people that you are discipling and training. And that is true. That is true. And the harvest grows slow. A spiritual harvest grows slow and is only seen at the end of the harvest. But there is a reward when the crop grows over time and the harvest time arrives. And there's that benefit. You will be the first to see the results of the growing season and the harvest. Now let me share with you another story of, uh, to illustrate this point. Uh, a couple of weeks ago when I was going through my sabbatical study week, I discovered an old, old journal from a little over 20 years ago that I thought I had discarded a very long time ago. And so I'm reading through this journal and it I, I wrote some notes that there was a couple that had started attending, it would be my previous church now, and this husband and wife couple, they would come each Sunday morning, and I remember, I kind of had this flashback in my mind, they would sit over on this side of, of the church sanctuary worship center, and they came every Sunday, they were very quiet, very reserved, but they came for three or four months really saying very little, and I didn't really know them very well, and I didn't really know if anything was really happening at all spiritually with this couple. Until one Sunday, they said, we have recently become followers of Jesus. I was like, wow, okay, that was great news. A few weeks later, Sunday morning before the service, the, the, the man said, would you have some time this week that we could just maybe spend the day together? It's like, yeah, that would be great. And so we did that, and, and he took me to a number of key places in that area where he had grown up and where his parents had lived and all that. And then for lunch, we went to the truck stop. He, he was a trucker, and I don't remember all the details if he was a um, long-haul trucker or short uh, uh, trucker, I'm not sure, but we went to the truck stop for lunch, and he said, I want all of my friends, my fellow truck drivers to meet you and for you to meet them. And I was like, okay. So we went to the diner. Uh, there was probably 10 or 12 of the truck drivers there, and I was introduced, that they, were, uh, they introduced themselves to me, and then this man who had recently come to know the Lord Jesus in a personal way, he, he shared with his fellow truck drivers what he had done, the decision that he had made in his life. And it was a wonderful day. And I wrote in my journal, this was one of the most wonderful days of my life. And I, I do remember that now. It was a wonderful day. And it kind of reminded me what it must have been like when Jesus went and 
to, to Matthew's house. To, remember, to the tax collector's house, and, and Jesus meets all of Matthew's friends, all the tax collectors. That was what that day was like. It was a very, very special day. But to see the first uh, glimpse of the spiritual growth of this baby Christian, wow, there's nothing more exciting than that. It's challenging, difficult work because oftentimes, even as a pastor, as someone that is, um, or someone that's discipling and training uh, another young Christian, you don't see that growth from day to day. It's like a farmer going out in the field and it's like, all I see is dirt. All I see is dirt. All I see is dirt. And then you just see that little, first little leaf coming out of the ground. You know, in farming, it's, it's weeks and months, but in disciple-making, it's years and decades. Sometimes it's not for several decades that you actually really see that tremendous spiritual growth. So we have to be that patient farmer. Now, in verses 8 and following, Paul gives to Timothy and gives to us three motives, three motives for this sacrificial ministry of being a spiritual trainer, being a pastor, being a teacher. Here are the three motives. Let's look at verse 8 for the first one. He says, if you need to be motivated, here's motivation number one. He says, Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, a descendant of King David. He says, on the days that you are wondering if you're making any impact, if you even want to continue on in this disciple-making process of being a spiritual trainer, remember Jesus the Christ who has been raised from the dead. Don't ever forget that. Now, this is actually, again, another command, another imperative. And literally what Paul says here is continue to remember, continue to remember the risen Christ. That's your motivation. Jesus has been raised from the dead. This is the one you're serving. This is the one that you're introducing people to. Never forget the risen Christ. Remember that Jesus is 100% God and also 100% man, that he is a descendant of King David. Secondly, in verse 9, remember that God's word is not imprisoned. It is not chained. It is not chained. Let's read verse 9. For which I am suffering even to the point of, of being chained like a criminal, but... God's word is not chained. It is not imprisoned. God's word is powerful and continues to do its work. Paul says, I'm in a dungeon, I'm in chains, chains, but the word of God, the scriptures, the Bible, it is still powerful, it is still working in the lives of people. Over in 2 Timothy 3.16, let me just turn my page here and read it. It says, all scripture is God-breathed, is inspired. It is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So Paul says, the word of God is not limited in any way. It is still working. And that is still true today, isn't it? That the Word of God, the Scriptures, the Bible is powerful and still working in people's lives to do great things. Don't ever forget that. Don't ever forget it. And then verse 10. Paul says to Timothy, remember, some people will. Some people will rest respond to God's mercy and grace. Not everybody. Maybe not millions of people that you know, or thousands, or even hundreds of people. But there will be some that will respond to God's mercy and grace. He says, therefore, I endure 
everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may attain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Now this word elect, that's a big word. We could spend a long time talking about that. But that is how we understand that some people, the elect, the people that God, in a sense, we could say has chosen, they will respond. They will. And as Doug said last week, we don't know who they are. And it may be the ones that we would at least expect. I, I got a nice note this week from someone that was listening to the, to the message last week and said, wow, I have an example of someone in my family that is responding that I never thought would respond. Say, so we never know. And, but we need to remember that some people will respond to God's mercy and grace. And so Paul says, I endure every hardship knowing that some people will respond. Now, that, may that be encouraging to you. Now, Acts 20, verse 24, Paul says this, however, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. He says, that's why I do this. I'm going to finish the race. Timothy, finish the race. And I would say to you, finish the race as being a spiritual trainer of telling people, testifying to the good news of God's grace. Now quickly, let's come to verse 14. Here is the fourth metaphor. He says, keep reminding God's people of these things. And we're going to see in the following verses next week in, in verse 15, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. And so the fourth metaphor is to be a diligent worker, to be a diligent worker, but keep reminding God's people of these things. So that begs the question, what things? And I think it goes back to the three things that we have just looked at and taken some time to uh, consider this morning. Number one, remember the risen Christ. Remember the risen Christ. Remember the Bible is powerful and, and is life-changing. Remember evangelism of telling people about Jesus. These are the things, as your pastor... I am to remind you of over and over and over. These are the three things that you as a spiritual trainer, as a disciple maker, as you work with a brand new Christian or a person that's been a Christian for a period of time or a person that you're working with to, to help them move along in their spiritual journey, what are we to do? What are you to do? Focus on Jesus. So let's think about the challenge and vision for United Baptist Church for 2022. What am I going to say? You probably already know it. As I was studying this last week during my sabbatical week, and, and I had been praying, God, what would you want me to challenge to United Baptist Church for these next 12 months? I wasn't sure until I'm studying through this passage, and it's like, oh, I, I think, I think I, I, I've discovered the three things. Risen Christ needs to be our focus. Risen Christ, uh, the, the Word of God, the Bible, uh, evangelism, telling and sharing other people, and so we, I'd already announced that back at the end of last year. So, what might this look like? What might be the vision as we go forward of what this could actually look like by the end of this year? Uh, one of the things that the Lord has laid upon my heart and Lord willing that after we finish this series in 2 Timothy, we are going to move on to the book of Luke, one of the four Gospels. 
And I don't think we've looked at that for a number of years. But in so doing, I want us to focus upon Jesus Christ. I want to focus upon the risen Christ. I want us to go in our groups, in our Bible studies, and one-on-one, in our triads, whatever form it might take, to be in the Word of God. Uh, I have been so, so honestly delighted in how many of you have responded to my challenge back uh, a month or so ago of doing the 52-week New Testament reading plan. So many of you have contacted me and said, I'm actually doing this and I'm still doing it. I haven't given up yet. That is just one way of getting into the Word of God because the Word of God is powerful. It is active. It will teach you. It will correct you. It will rebuke you. It will train you in how to live right. So one-on-one, just by yourself, one-on-one in in a triad, in in a group setting, be in the Word of God. So we're going to keep coming back to that, and we're thinking of some creative ways of how to do that and, and look forward in the coming weeks as we talk about that. And then evangelism. What must we be about? To tell people about Jesus. And we're going to spend some time over these next few months of practicing. How do we do that? We're going to practice in our groups with each other. How do we go and do that? And because in the same way that Hiram Barry trained his troops, in a sense, to go into battle, we need to do some training as we go and really learn how do we share Jesus, how do we teach Jesus to the people around us. Now, let me tell you this final story, and and then we'll be done this morning. When I was uh, 19 or 20 years old, I came back to uh, Rockland after my first year of Bible college for the summer. And I don't remember the details, but I think somebody invited me, or maybe I volunteered, I'm not sure, but I think someone asked me to go and, on a monthly basis for those summer months, probably three or four times, to go to the local nursing home, to Knox Nursing Home along with Miss Charlotte Cook, who many of you may have heard of over the years. She was our church organist and church secretary at my home church for 54, 55 years. And she always volunteered to play the piano. So on a Sunday afternoon, we would go to the local nursing home, and Charlotte would play the piano, and we would sing some of the old-fashioned, well-known hymns. And then I would go and share a a, a short Bible message of maybe... um, 10 or 15 minutes. If you uh, think of the senior citizen luncheon and and kind of that devotional type of thing, that's kind of what we did, what I would do. And so um, I would go and share, and I was very new, but it was a great way to, uh, very new at at teaching and preaching, but it was a great way for me to practice. And so I I remember the first or second time that I ever did this, and, and I don't remember exactly what I spoke on, but at the end, I shared John 3, 16. And John 3.16, let's just put it on the screen for, to be reminded of this. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Now, we know that so well. And the reason I shared it that day was I thought many of the residents also knew it well from learning it years and years before, maybe even as a child it was in their long-term memory, and I think many of them did. But there was a lady that always sat in the front row, always. And every time we would come on the Sunday afternoon, she would always tell me her name, and she would always tell me that she was an Episcopalian. I don't know why she did that, but she always did. And on this afternoon that I, that I share, that I quote John 3.16, she just hollers out in her loudest outside voice, tell us something new. Tell us something new. We've already heard that before. Now, to be fair to this lady, maybe she had heard that many times before. And she did want to hear something new. But I think there's something in us, in, human, in our humanness, in our, in our, in our, as a human being, that we're always looking for something new. I know I have a tendency to do that, that somehow new is better. And so I'm not sharing with you anything that's new today. 
in my challenge, in my vision for 2022 as a church, there's nothing new. Jesus. But you can't go wrong with Jesus, because as we're going to look at in a few weeks, that a hundred years from now, Jesus is still going to be beneficial, as he was a hundred years ago. Uh, The Bible uh, is nothing new, but a hundred years from now, it is still going to be all-powerful, as it was a hundred years ago. The gospel message, this great news of Jesus, is going to be just as wonderful a hundred years from now as it was 2,000 years ago. Now, there may be new ways of, of how we are going to do that as a church and look at these topics, and so I'm not presenting to you anything new, but really things that are very old. But what did Paul say? Remember these things. Keep reminding God's people of these things. And so, that's what we're going to do. That is my challenge to you. That is my vision for you as we go through these coming weeks and coming months. So let's close in a word of prayer today. Father, we thank you for the risen Christ. We thank you that Jesus came to earth 2,000 years ago, that he lived the perfect life. He was our substitute on the cross of Calvary, he was buried. He came back to life three days later, never to die again. And we thank you for the word of God. We thank you that it is powerful. It is life-changing, that we need to be in it. We need to be reading it and studying and meditating upon it and applying it to our lives. So God, I pray that this year that we do that well that we go and we share with other people about Jesus, that he is the Savior of the world. And Lord, that we would not just do this for ourselves, but we would do all these things as a spiritual trainer, that Jesus would be our focal point, that the Word of God would be our source, that evangelism would be our means, that we would tell everyone we know about Jesus. So, God, would you help us in these next 12 months to be the best spiritual trainers, best spiritual coaches, best spiritual teachers that we could be with the people around us that more and more people would know and love the Lord Jesus Christ by the end of the year. So, God, help us to do that. Help us to do that individually. Help us to do that as a church. God, I ask your blessing upon each one that is part of this church family that in these coming months that you would bless them and grow them and mature them and that we, by the end of the year, would be more like Jesus Christ than we have ever been before. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Fill us with your strength and power as we go on mission for you, that real relay race to go and to share others about what Jesus has done and is doing and will do. To the end we would pray in Jesus' name. Amen. May you have a great day and a great week, and may the Lord richly bless you this day, this week, and in this year that's before us. Have a great day.